What's up everybody, how's it going? In this video, we are gonna be talking about design docs and software engineering. What is a design doc? How do you write one? Or even gonna be looking at a real life example of a design doc. Why are we doing a video on design docs, you're wondering? Well, believe it or not, it's one of my most requested videos. A lot of you have asked for it. And you know the drill by now. I am a public servant. When the people demand, I provide. And similarly, when I demand that the people smash the like button, you provide. It's a beautiful exchange, isn't it? Capitalism at work. A smashing of the like button for a video topic of your choice. So what is, wait, did that fall? Oh my God, I've been trying to put these things up because some of you asked that I decorate this wall. This was my first attempt at decorating it and apparently this just doesn't want to stick to it. Okay, so what is a design doc? Well, a design doc is a document where you design stuff. That's gonna be it for this video. I really hope that you found it informative. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Don't forget to smash the like button and I'm just messing with you. Okay, so for real, what is a design doc? Perhaps I should preface my definition of a design doc by saying that design docs are surprisingly subjective. In other words, some people might tell you that a design doc is this, others might tell you that a design doc is that, some might tell you that it should be written this way, others that way. I'm gonna tell you what I've determined a design doc to be from my two years of experience as a software engineer at Google. As I've previously mentioned on this channel, Google has a very design doc driven engineering culture where pretty much any feature at Google is accompanied by a design doc. But even at Google, different engineers on different teams have different definitions of what a design doc is or what a design doc should be. So I'm gonna be giving you my definition based on my experience at Google. Take that with a grain of salt. So you can think of a design doc as a document that a software engineer writes up for a feature before implementing that feature. And the purpose of the document is to sort of scope out the feature, or rather scope out how it'll be implemented, how it'll be designed, to list potentially contentious aspects of the design, and this is a really important part, so I'll repeat it, to list potentially contentious aspects of the design, to highlight maybe alternative designs or alternative things that could be done to implement this feature, and to basically open a discussion between all the engineers on the team on how a feature will be designed and implemented before it's actually designed and implemented. So that basically captures what a design doc is. Now at this point you might be thinking, well, okay, that sort of makes sense, but I still don't really know what a design doc actually is. And if that's the case, don't worry, because we're now gonna look at a real example of a design doc. The bad news is that unfortunately, I can't show you a design doc from Google because I don't have access to documents from Google anymore and that would be confidential information anyway. The good news, however, is that I can show you a design doc from Algo Expert, my company. And by the way, if you're preparing for coding interviews like the ones at Google, not gonna say anything, but algoexpert.io, promo code CLEM, C-L-E-M, I'll leave it at that. Okay, so basically on Algo Expert right now, we're working on a ton of stuff, but one of the features that we're working on is what we're calling the Algo Expert Certificate. It's something that a lot of customers have requested. It's basically gonna be a certificate of completion. When you complete all of the questions on Algo Expert, when you consume all the content on Algo Expert, we will give you a certificate of completion that you can probably put on your resume or that you can show on your LinkedIn, something like that. It's been highly requested, and now that we have the resources and the time to allocate to building out a bunch of features, we are finally working on it. Now, we recently got a new engineer on the team, specifically working on the back end, who's handling the back end aspect of this feature. And recently, after chatting about the feature with us a little bit, she decided to write a design doc for the feature. And so this is what I'm about to show you. So the first thing that you'll notice is that the design doc is written on a simple Google doc. And this is the case at Google as well. This is precisely meant to be like a document written in English, not code. The document starts with a summary of the feature. This is especially useful when you're at a big company like Google and you might have 
tons of people reading this document who don't have context on the feature. At Algo Expert here, you can imagine that we all know about this feature, but again, at a big company or in the future, having a summary in the document is really helpful. And to be clear, I am not saying that this is a perfect design doc or the canonical example of a design doc. No, this is just one example of what one design doc might look like. Keeping in mind that this was done for an Algo Expert feature, not a Google feature, we're not a team of 30 or 100 engineers, we're a team of five people, so just do keep that in mind. Then the document outlines some of the impact that this feature is gonna have on the UX and on the UI, and here I wanna point out one thing. This line right here that says, note, we may wanna disable code submission if the user has viewed one of our solutions or unblurred test cases. So as you can see, we actually had a pretty big comment thread on this particular line, and this is a really good example of what a design doc is for. This happened to be a fairly contentious part of the feature, so to explain what's going on here, as part of this course certificate feature, we're going to have a new button on the coding workspace that's going to be submit code as opposed to run code, and submit code is going to be the button that you press when you have completely finished the problem and you want to officially submit it. If submitting code passes all the test cases, then we mark that question as officially complete. And if you submit all of the questions successfully, then you get the course certificate. And so here she said, we may want to disable code submission if the user has viewed one of our solutions or unblurred test cases. Now, as you can imagine, this is kind of contentious because what I pointed out in the comment is, are we going to prevent users from getting the course certificate altogether just because they look at one solution? That seems a little bit harsh. It also kind of takes away from our platform. And so we had a back and forth here. We then talked about it offline, which just means online, but like in our chat app rather than on a Google Doc. And this was a good thing to talk about right now before we've actually implemented the feature. You see, what this prevented is having someone, maybe this person, implement the feature in one way, and then only after it's been implemented, realizing, well, wait a second, we didn't want to implement it in that way. So this is just a good example of a contentious thing about a feature to put in the design doc. Now here, one note that I would say is I would have probably called this particular line out a little bit more. Like here, she just said note and then the line. I would have probably put this under an entire subsection called contentious issues because again, from my experience at Google, these contentious issues are the most interesting aspects of design docs. And by the way, this is actually something that I've stolen from one of my managers at Google who would always say like, the main purpose of a design doc is to really hash out those contentious issues. It's the interesting stuff, the stuff where you know people might disagree on something. But so yeah, here I would have called it out a little bit more. Anyway, moving on. Here she defines the API surface. This is another thing that can be really useful in a design doc to really lay out what the API is gonna look like. Why is that good? Because again, you can imagine that writing an API might not be trivial, it might take quite a bit of time. And if you write an entire API in code, you implement all of the endpoints, all of the types, everything, only to after realize that, wait, we wanted to change something, or this doesn't work for the UI, or someone has a problem with it, you've wasted a lot of time. So here in a Google Doc, you can just quickly write out the surface of the API, just briefly explain like, oh, there's gonna be four endpoints, they're gonna take this as parameters, they're gonna return that and see if people disagree with it. And here, by the way, there's another good example of something really positive that came out of this design doc on this API surface. You see this send email certificate endpoint that we had, where we basically said, oh, if a user has completed all of the questions, they can request to have a course certificate sent to them. So Antoine left a comment on this where he said, hey, uh, the person who wrote this design doc, we're, we're putting question marks just to, for privacy, but she mentioned that it might be nicer to have a download as PDF button, which I totally agree with. So this was something that, you know, they mentioned offline or elsewhere, you know, in the chat app. And then we talked about it, you know, after I saw this comment, we talked about it and we decided, yeah, it actually makes more sense instead of having an email that exposes us to a lot of other issues and so instead, we can have a download as a PDF button. You get the course certificate as a PDF. It looks even more legitimate than just an email. And that's what we decided to go with for this feature. So this is just another good example of something positive that came out of writing this design doc. We were able to shift the direction of this feature or of an implementation detail.
detail of the feature without having to actually implement that detail and then throw it away. So that was an example of a real design doc. As you saw, it was pretty simple, nothing too complicated, but there were a few really positive things that we got from this design doc. I'll admit this design doc was pretty short. It was more like what people at Google call a one-pager, which is a one-page document that tends to spill over one page. Design docs at Google tend to be quite a bit longer than this. I would say that they're typically anywhere between three and like 12 pages. Some features at Google are gigantic. They affect so many different teams, so many different services. Like I remember on Google Cloud Platform, there was this design doc for a feature that was like, middleware in between the UI and the API. It was really big and it was a design doc that was like 20 pages long. It had really useful stuff in it, lots of discussions, really good to understand how this entire thing had been implemented, but it was really long. And I guess this is one of the additional benefits of design docs, which is especially apparent at a big tech company like Google, is the fact that they serve as these sort of permanent artifacts that you can read to ramp yourself up to a service or to an API or to understand why a feature was designed the way that it was. And this is really useful when you're at a big company like Google. I certainly don't think that we would feel this right now on Algo Expert, for instance, but when you're at Google and you're interacting with a giant service or a really complicated thing that was implemented by someone three years ago who's no longer on the team or no longer at the company, it can be really helpful to have a doc that you can read that explains why this was created, how it works. All that to say, really, design docs have a lot of cool uses. Now, before I end this video, I do want to talk about some of the downsides of writing design docs, because it's not all sunshine and rainbows like I've portrayed it to be so far. There are really three main downsides that I can think of. The first one is that writing a design doc isn't easy. It's actually pretty hard, and I'm not going to claim to be an expert. I think that I'm decent at it now, but I certainly remember that I wasn't good at the very beginning. During my first year at Google, I was struggling a lot with it. I remember, for me, the main difficulty was that I was treating writing a design doc sort of like you treat writing an essay when you're in college or in high school, and so it was more like an assignment that I was delivering something that I would be graded on almost. I really wanted to make it perfect and very academic, but I was losing sight of the actual purpose of the design doc, and that wasn't good. Some people don't put enough in their design docs. Some people put way too much. Some people don't write well. Some people don't have good writing skills or need to work on their writing skills. So there are a lot of things that can make people not good at writing design docs, and that can mean that you then have pretty bad design docs that don't really serve their purpose. The second thing that can be bad about writing design docs is that sometimes you really don't need them. Sometimes they're really just slowing you down. Like I would say that for Algo Expert, most of the time, at least right now, we're probably not gonna need to write a design doc. Here, this feature just happened to lend itself pretty well to this. We had also talked about how I was gonna make a video on design docs and it would have been great to have an example. So that's kind of why we did it. But overall, there are a lot of times where it just doesn't make sense to bog yourself down by writing a design doc if you're trying to move really fast. This is why at Facebook, for instance, I didn't see any design docs. I'm sure that there were some of them here and there, but there weren't nearly as many design docs as there were at Google. And at Google, sometimes it did kind of feel like you were writing a design doc just for the sake of writing a design doc, or maybe just because you wanted to have an artifact for performance evaluation time. And that's just kind of like, you get into those weird bureaucracy or big company problems that kind of suck. So what I'm getting at is that sometimes design docs just aren't needed and they just slow you down and it sucks if you feel like you have to do them. The third and final thing that really sucks about design docs, and I definitely felt this at Google, is that sometimes when you're at a big tech company, if you've got, let's say, 30 people reading one design doc and you've got 30 very talented but also very opinionated engineers commenting on the same feature, the same implementation detail, you can have comment threads on one Google Doc that are literally longer than the entire Google Doc itself. 
and you'll just have people like arguing with each other or disagreeing and you feel like you're getting nowhere. It's super confusing to read. Or sometimes people treat it as like the only communication channel for the feature. Like instead of talking about it in person or on a video call by chat, they'll talk in a Google Docs comment and that can really slow things down. It's really frustrating and it's just one of the downsides of Google Docs or of Design Docs rather. This is why Google can feel very slow sometimes. I still love Google, but really sometimes those Design Doc comment discussions are just like too much. Anyway, that's all I've got about Design Docs. I really hope that this clarified things about Design Docs. I feel like Design Docs, like a lot of other things in software engineering, are this very nebulous thing. But once you understand what they are, once you watch a video like this one, which hopefully is gonna turn out all right, you realize they're just a very simple concept. They're not at all scary, they're not at all confusing, and yeah, they're a pretty cool aspect of a software engineer's job. So with that, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, smash the like button, and I'll see you in the next video.